right? So this is the part where it does start to really parallel the life and death aspect of Paro's cruelty to Bnei Israel in Mitzrayim, in, in Egypt, because this idea of, oh, the people, you know, are becoming too sort of ornery, too uh, numerous and strong, we have to get rid of the males, right? So first, maybe the midwives, you know, can kill off the males when they're born, or no, that's not working, so we have to throw them in the Nile. Obviously, this is about archetypes, and, and, and not, or it can be about archetypes, and not only about actual biological males and females, it's about stamping out masculinity in some sense. And masculinity obviously correlates with aggression, it correlates with uh, expression of physical force, uh, and obviously that's a generalization that we associate it with the archetypes of different uh, sexes. And so it, it's not that it can't be the case that either an individual man or woman could be one way or another. But archetypally, getting rid of the males is about getting rid of the strength to fight, right? And the will uh, to dominate or the will to conquer and all of these things that Israel has had eaten out of it partly by American policy over the course of decades, uh, where it's always been about any time Israel shows too much uh, military strength, it's always, oh, that's disproportionate, don't go overboard, you're, you're indiscriminately bombing, you're uh, you know, being uh, brutal in the way that you're dealing with your enemies, and we are no longer comfortable you know, with, with your being our ally if you act that way. And of course, being our ally is so valuable that you have to tone it down. You have to be more gentle. And, and so there's been this love-hate thing where America loves Israel, but America wants Israel to be meeker and less threatening to its enemies, less capable of fighting independently. All of these things uh, that parallel the magnification of a feminine archetype. And so that parallels very much this, this thing with our own trying to get rid of um, the males uh, amongst the Hebrews, right? And that policy has actually been literally deadly for Am Yisrael, for the Jews. It's not just the case that it all is sort of metaphorically parallel to what Paro did. Paro was literally saying, throw the boys in the Nile. So maybe Americans are not saying to Israel, throw your male children into some river, but in practice, it is the case that our soldiers and our more vulnerable people have been slaughtered in greater numbers because Israel has, over time, become more and more beholden to an American policy that requires co cooperation with the PA, that requires appeasement and some kind of calculus of partial deterrence with vicious enemies like Hamas and Hezbollah. And then that leads to, uh, certainly, you know, for a long time, for decades, the quote-unquote pinpricks of constant terror attacks where Jews are murdered. And everyone treated that for a long time. Not everyone, I should say, but everyone in the American government uh, and most leaders in the Israeli government treated that like bad weather about which nothing could really be done. And then we finally kicked off uh, the war that we're fighting right now with the same thing happening on a tremendously greater scale, and people finally have to some degree woken up to the fact that that death by a thousand cuts eventually just leads to amplification and the slide down the slippery slope to doom. Uh, and now we have to face the fact that we have to act a different way. We have to fight our enemies a different way, and we have to be free from the domination of the American policy that has constantly been pressuring Israel over the course of decades to, to operate this way uh, to its detriment. And so that's the kind of uh, notion of Yitzhak Mitzrayim that I'm interested in here, the, the, the notion of the liberation that's needed, that in that view, America is to Israel a kind of paro, and we are still in the mentality of, and therefore in a kind of a spiritual state of being in Egypt, being stuck and slave to paro, and we still have to get our heads out of that and get our national consciousness in a different frame. And from, from that realization, we can go to understanding what the significance of Korban Pesach is, what the significance of uh, the uh, Paschal offering is. Because 
what we now can learn is, what is it specifically that we're being asked to do in the Paschal offering? And how does that translate into the present day in lighting the way to what it means for us to pull free from Paro, to get away from uh, American dominance uh, in determination of our security and military and foreign policy? So I think in the end, the point there is, is a fairly simple one. What is Korban Pesach? You slaughter a lamb, a seh, and you take in the instance of Korban Pesach de Mitzrayim, right? When you're in Egypt, what what was that? What is the form of that uh, uh, offering consist of? You're in Mitzrayim, you slaughter the lamb, you take the blood of that lamb, and you're painting it on your doorposts, right? And on the lintel of your door, but all around your doorway. So there are different elements um, that uh, we can understand there. And also there's the Ezov, the Hisab we mentioned before. So there, there are a few different elements to understand here. One of them is clearly that the lamb is the most gentle and innocent and harmless creature, seemingly. And that's being slaughtered by B'nai Israel because it is a mitzvah, because it is a commandment by Hashem that this is what you do. And what that is requiring of B'nai Israel is, is not just that they are slaughtering a lamb and showing Hashem that they will do that because Hashem commanded it, but to also remember it's a blasphemy, it's a defilement in the eyes of the Mitzrayim. It's a defilement of their gods. It's a rejection of their ideological system. Right? It's smashing their idols, so to speak. So, well, why does that sound familiar? The idea of being willing to slaughter an innocent lamb because it's a commandment of Hashem and to show to your oppressor that you pay no respect to his gods and that you're willing to blaspheme according to his standards. That is what we've already been talking about in terms of defining our conduct in warfare, right? The whole discourse around this war coming from America is you can't hurt a head or on the head of the tremendous majority of completely innocent civilians that you have to fight amongst. And so you have to tie all your hands and feet behind your back while you're fighting, put your own soldiers at risk, dramatically increase your casualties, dramatically reduce the enemy's casualties, prevent yourself from being able to fight the war to completion, prevent yourself from being able to deter the enemy, to drive the enemy away. All these things that are you know, 101, like how you actually achieve total victory in a war in the Middle East, uh, you're not allowed to do any of those things, uh, uh, even if it's commanded according to the Torah. And, and that's the thing that we have to realize, is that if it is a mitzvah to fight the war a certain way, then that is what B'nai Yisrael should be doing. And that's the case even if it requires doing something that is not appealing for this. It's not, the idea of slaughtering a lamb is not something to a person who has an inclination to gentleness, who has an inclination to making peace, who has an inclination to kindness, etc. Perhaps eating a lamb, maybe, you know, uh, in the case of a lamb, can be enjoyable, but the slaughtering of a lamb presumably is not something that you take pleasure in. But if Akadosh Baruch Hu is commanding it, right, if, if it's part of his Torah, that in this instance, in this situation, doing that which is distasteful is actually required because it's the right thing. It's the way you serve God in this instance, then you do it, right? And, and that translating to conduct of war would be to say, look, it may not be enjoyable for anyone to fight a war in a way that leads people who aren't at this exact moment running towards you with a weapon to be in harm's way, but that's how you win a war and that's distasteful. And if it's the right thing to fight the war and win it, according to the Torah, which it is, then you do that. And you, you gladly do it insofar as you are accomplishing the commandment of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even if there's some aspect of it that isn't pretty or that is distasteful. And moreover, you do it, dafka, to, on purpose, to make a point as well to the oppressor, meaning that... Israel right now 
to whatever degree it wants to throw our O's chains off its back, the way to do that would be to say, you are trying to tie our hands and make us send our sons to the slaughter, right? That's what Paro does to Bnei Yisrael. And what we're going to do instead is say, we're going to keep the Torah, and according to the mitzvot that we've been given by Hashem, we're going to be willing to shed the blood of quote-unquote innocence, uh, which is represented by the Lamb in the course of conducting warfare properly according to the Torah, and we'll do that as a defilement of your false gods. Right? This is what Israel needs to be saying to America. This is what it should be doing. And that is not just about, uh, let's say, a uh, way of conducting war to make war successful in and of itself. It's also perhaps even more so because this is what's emphasized by the Lamb. It's about the importance of the symbolic gesture, the public demonstration of loyalty to Hashem and defilement of the false gods of the oppressor who is tying your hands and making you slaughter your own sons. And that in the merit of that turn towards Hashem, Akados Baruch who then is willing to bring his hand into the equation uh, and set us free.